I'm wondering whether we should start ahead of time. <laughs> okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Kishore Mabubani. I'm the Dean of the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy at the National University of Singapore. And I'm sure the first question in your mind is, why is this man from Singapore chairing a forum on the future of American power? <laughs> well, I, guess, I think Davos wants to prove that occasionally he makes mistakes. <laughs> Uh, anyway, it's a great pleasure to welcome you because we are addressing an extremely uh, important topic today. Um, what I propose to do is just let you know quickly that I, I'm just a traffic cop. Uh, I will make a few brief introductory comments and then I'll pose maybe one or two rounds of questions to this very distinguished panel that I'll introduce in a minute. And then we'll throw the floor open for questions from the floor. And I hope you were all ready for some good, hard, uh, tough questions, because the tougher the question, the better the discussion. And I'm sure the panel will be very happy to have the tough questions. So let me, let me begin in a kind of a stage setting kind of way, make three broad points. The first point, of course, the obvious point is that in some ways the question of the future of American power in the 21st century is probably the most important question of the day. Because if you look at how the 20th century evolved, much of it, as you know, was driven by American power. The whole history of the 20th century was driven by American power. And of course, there are debates, was it good, was it bad? But in many parts of the world, it was viewed as very benign. In fact, just yesterday, in fact, right on this stage, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Farid Zakaria was interviewing the Prime Minister of Singapore 24 hours ago. And the Prime Minister of Singapore said, as a matter of fact, that the American power in the Asia Pacific has been extremely benign and frankly, it could even serve as a model for China at some point in time. And so that's the first reason why this panel is, is so important. The second point, of course, is that uh, while American power, of course, still remains number one in the world, the big question is about the future. Is it going to keep on rising? Will it remain stagnant? Or, heaven forbid, will it even decline? And I know that decline is not a, a word that is used a lot within the American discourse. But as I told the panelists, it's unfortunately being used outside quite a bit. So it may be interesting to get the external and internal perspectives of where American power is heading. And the third point I want to make is that, and in that sense, is really, we are really fortunate to have this distinguished panel here, is that, as you know, within America, uh, the political system, let me try and put this very gently, has become quite polarized. And this polarization within the American political system is perceived by the rest of the world to have affected uh, American power vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. So to have two uh, distinguished Republicans and two distinguished Democrats on this panel, I think gives it a tremendous amount of uh, power uh, in the discussions that we're going to have. So uh, let me just briefly, briefly introduce them. On my immediate left is Senator Saxby Chambliss, a senator from Georgia. Uh, he holds a very important position as Vice Chairman of the Senate Select Committee on Intelligence and also a member of the Armed Services Committee. So when we discuss, for example, the announcement made by Secretary Panetta today that there would be $500 billion of cuts in American defense budgets, we can talk about the implications of that. Uh, we have then Senator Bob Cocker, the Senator from Tennessee. He's the ranking member of the U.S. Senate Committee on Foreign Relations and if the Republicans win the Senate in November, you might become the chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. Next to him, we have Dr. Michael Froman, uh, who is the Deputy Assistant to the U.S. President and Deputy National Security Advisor for International Economic Affairs, and also the G20 Sherpa. And last but not least is Congresswoman Nita M. Lowy. Um, she's from the 18th District uh, State of New York. And she's in charge of foreign aid and through the role that she's played in the House Appropriations Committee. So we have a very uh, uh, wonderfully well-balanced panel. So let me, let me start the discussion by asking the first question about how each and every one of you see 
the future of American power in the 21st century? Do you see it as, in a sense, constantly rising? Or do you see that as, are, there, are the concerns about it be declining real or misplaced? So, Senator Chambliss, we'll start with you first. Well, first of all, let me say that, um, uh, you know, perceptions are just what they are. They're perceptions. When you look at the realities of what's going on in our world today, uh, the world is a very changed place from where it was five years ago. Certainly, it's a very changed place from where it was 10 years ago. Uh, the advent of the Internet has made dramatic changes. Um, we're, um, uh, we're now seeing uh, the unfortunate military conflicts being brought into everybody's living room all across the world on a regular basis. There are just any number of things that have contributed, uh, I think, probably to what I truly believe is a perception. Um, uh, does the United States have issues that we have to deal with? You bet. We have very, very serious issues. Are we uh, uh, operating from a governing standpoint the way that I would like to see, or probably any of the four of us up here would like to see? I think the question is no. Um, but that being said, I, I would say this. I think there are three areas where the United States has always provided um, not just the right kind of, of image, but from a practical standpoint, we have been the leader of the free world. First of all, is with the economy. Uh, we, in spite of our problems now, we still have a very strong economy and we have the world's largest economy. Um, we've got to fix it. We've got a real problem with our economy and it needs fixing. And what we do is going to impact the economy of every other country in the world. And we've got to make sure that not only we do it right, but we do it soon. And we are not there today. Secondly, uh, we have been the, uh, the military power of the world for several decades, certainly going back to uh, the conclusion of World War II. And we have not necessarily the largest army or the largest military, but from a technological standpoint, we are certainly the most advanced military, and that gives us a huge edge. And the numbers of, of individuals that wear the uniform of the United States today are different from what they were 10 years ago, just in numbers. But there's another difference that is of more importance to citizens of the United States, and that is that our military today does not operate on a draft system. Every, every young person coming into or coming out of school used to have to go into the military unless you had a fiscal reason why you couldn't. Today, our military is an all-volunteer military, which means that the men and women that wear the uniform of the United States of America are there because they're patriotic, they want to be there, they know today, and they know of over the last decade, that when they raise their right hand and swear it up over the Constitution of the United States, they're getting ready to go into a military conflict. So the makeup of our military is very, very patriotic, very, very committed, and we're going to remain the world's strongest military power. We, we can't afford to be in second place. I know we'll talk more about these, uh, the, the cuts and whatnot, but just uh, just know that that will be the case. And then thirdly, the United States, from a leadership standpoint, has always had individuals, whether it was uh, the president or members of Congress or whatever, that have been in prime leadership roles, again, for decades. And right now, if you had to point to who is the leader on the Republican side? Who is the leader on the Democratic side? Obviously, the president's a Democrat, and certainly that's where their leadership comes from. On the Republican side, it's probably a little bit of a mixed bag because we have control of the House, and we have a speaker there. He's a logical, maybe the, the uh, leader of the Republicans. But, um, we're in the minority on the Senate side. The minority leader is in a leadership role. Is he the guy that is leading the Republicans? Well, if you watch presidential debates, uh, you know, you, you'll get a mixed bag of all of that, too. But I think the fact is that America has not provided the right kind of leadership on world issues over the last several years, and I'm not just referring to this administration, 
But I think that we've got to step up our game there. We ought not to have to have a president who um, um, feels compelled for whatever reason to go around the world and apologize for acts of the United States. Uh, was a little bit uh, infuriating to a number of us. Uh, so uh, from the standpoint of where we're going to be, um, from an economic standpoint, we're going to rebound. From a military standpoint, we'll always be the world's strongest military. From a leadership standpoint, I'm confident that we'll continue to provide the world with the right kind of leaders that exhibit <coughs> true leadership worldwide. Well, I must say thank you for that very careful, nuanced presentation pointing out both the strengths and weaknesses and challenges. So I'm going to turn to the Democrat now. We agreed that we would alternate. So Congressman Lowy, would you like to give your perspective on how you see American power in the 21st century? Certainly, um, and I thank uh, the World Economic Forum for holding this session. I've been very pleased to serve on the State Department Foreign Operations Appropriations Committee. And when the Democrats are in charge, I was chair of the committee. Now Kay Granger is chair of the committee. And for those of you who haven't seen the article, The Odd Couple, it stressed the two Democrats that get along. And frankly, I was very pleased during the appropriations process that we were able to turn out a very strong bill. George Bush made it very clear that our national security depends on defense, diplomacy, and development. And I do believe that this bill that we produced does reflect our strong leadership in the world now and commits to our strong leadership in the future. And I am very pleased with the leadership of our president internationally. And if you've ever traveled with Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, as I have, if I didn't want to undermine her seriousness, I would say that she is a rock star and has the respect of all with whom she meets. I don't think there's a place that she hasn't traveled, and I would dare say the same for Vice President Biden. Now, I'd like to add one other dimension to this. Number one, we have to keep strong, and even though there are proposed cuts, there is no question for those of us who have looked at the defense budget, my colleagues on the Senate side would say, and I'm not going to go back to the $600 toilet seat, it's too serious an mm. issue, that there are places that can be cut carefully with discretion and maintain our strength. And certainly with regard to the foreign aid budget, we are providing very careful oversight because we know how important it is to spend our dollars wisely. I'd like to mention another area which I think is absolutely essential when you talk about American power in the world. Senator Shambliss talked about the economy. What we do with our infrastructure, what we do with our educational system, how we train our people for the future. We import many students from all over the world to our university system, and we're very proud of that. But I do think that we have to do a lot more within our elementary and high school systems to maintain our power and our status in the world. I was saying to our distinguished moderator, some of you may know Scarsdale, New York, we're doing Singapore math in Scarsdale, New York. And we had a discussion before this panel began about education in Singapore. So I'd like to just say that I have a great deal of confidence that American power, American respect in the world will be maintained. And I'd like to sum up not just with our military, because I do believe that our military will maintain the edge and will be a leader in the world but I do think we have to continue to invest in our diplomacy and our foreign aid programs as well. I'm very proud of the work that we do in lifting up people throughout 
the world when it comes to diseases, through the Global Fund, through other programs that fund tuberculosis, malaria, etc. I'm very proud of the work that we do in our villages everywhere throughout the world, again, to help alleviate poverty. And our foreign aid budget and our diplomacy budget, along with our military budget, must continue to reflect the tremendous needs internationally because that is the responsibility of a world power, not just to be strong militarily, but to make sure that we are capable of facing the many challenges to help people, help people fulfill their dreams, help people reach for the stars. That's the image of the United States of America that I want to continue to project. Thank you, and thank you for the plug for Singapore's textbooks. <laughs> please go and buy one now. <laughs> uh, Senator, Cal Senator Calca, please. Well, thank you. I, you know, I, a century's a long time, and, and uh, you know, you were talking about relative American power. The priest on the front row might say that, you know, comparisons are odious. Um, we have a term in our, in our country that describes American exceptionalism, and do I believe that America will demonstrate continued exceptionalism in the world over this next century? Absolutely. Um, I do. Your question, uh, your comment regarding the third item, and that is where we are politically, no doubt is affecting us in the short term. I mean, we as a country are faced with the same challenges that so many Western democracies are facing right now, and that is we've had politicians on both sides of the aisle for decades that have made commitments to citizens uh, that cannot be honored. And they're difficult decisions that we know reforms have to be made. Europe is facing that. Our country right now is, is somewhat paralyzed over those issues because of the partisanship that you talked about a minute ago, which, by the way, both sides uh, very much are at fault. It is my belief that uh, I know that you read the publications from the outside and you read about uh, sort of the negative things. Uh, I see a, a centrist group forming in both the House and the Senate uh, to deal with these issues that we have in our country, the, the, the tax reform elements that have to take place, the entitlement reform elements that have to take place, the long-term deficit issues that have to take place. And before we'll be able to, 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 to be the country that we all want to be around the world, those are going to have to be dealt with because what's happening internal to our country is a lot of nativist feelings are are coming out. People want us to sort of step back from the involvement that we have in the world because of the, own, the issues that we have at home. So I think the most important thing in the short term for us is to, to get our balance sheet in order. Um, I think we will get our balance sheet in order personally over the next two to three years. I wish we could get it together this year. Um, I don't think that's going to happen for a lot of reasons, but I do believe regardless of who is elected president, we're going to deal with those issues over the next two to three years. Um, on the military side, I would say that, look, um, I don't think there's any question that the United States of America will project itself around the world, but there has to be a rebalancing that does take place. I mean, you look at where we are with NATO right now and so many of the countries there, there are countries there honoring their commitments. But NATO was built on the fact that each country was going to commit a certain portion of their gross domestic product to NATO. And in many ways, our country has become the provider of protection. And many countries have been the consumers of protective services. And so that has to rebalance. But I absolutely believe this will be a century where America demonstrates exceptionalism. There's no doubt there will be economies that just due to demogra demographics are going to be different relative to ours. You look at countries with a billion people that are growing rapidly, that's going to change. But I think we will be an economic powerhouse. We will lead on democracy efforts. We will lead in being a force for good in this world. And the quicker, the quicker that we can deal with our balance sheet issues, the more energetic uh, in the near future uh, that will be. Dr. Froman? Uh, well, first of all, let me... Uh, first comment, and then we will move on. Yeah, Great. Ahead. First, let me thank you for uh, having me on the panel. And you have really three of, 
uh, the most effective and most internationalist legislators in our country here who have done great things on foreign assistance, on New START, on a whole range of intelligence and, and defense issues. So you, this really is, I think, a very, uh, uh, a very good group to talk to that. Um, let me just say a few things. One, when President Obama came into office, uh, he set out as his top priority to restore America's reputation and to strengthen its influence around the world. And that had many parts to it. One was to strengthen the alliances. And I think we can say right now our alliances, both in Europe and in Asia, uh, have never been stronger. And I point to Korea, Japan, Australia, uh, where we are seeing real strength in those alliances, as well as the NATO actions. Two, that it was critically important to get the great power relationships right. That if you don't have Russia and China in a, in a good place in your relationships, it's very hard to get anything else done. And that's what the restart was about. That's what engagement with China was about. And that's what allowed us, I think, to work very collaboratively, including through the UN Security Council, on issues like Iran and North Korea, and to build a coalition globally to address those issues. Uh, third, there was a desire to to do a strategic rebalancing. Um, there, for obvious reasons, there had been a great focus on Iraq and Afghanistan uh, previously, and there was a desire to re-engage with Asia, which we see as the fastest growing region for our economic potential, but also a, a region that's incredibly important to us uh, strategically. Uh, fourth, we set out to reform elements of the international architecture, precisely because having a rules-based system that reflects our values as well as our interests is our most effective way to exert influence over the long run. And things like the creation of the G20 or the institutionalization of it as the premier forum for international economic cooperation or the president's engagement with the East Asia Summit are just two examples of how we've tried to build, or the Trans-Pacific Partnership, examples of how we've tried to build rules-based architecture to reflect the new realities of the, uh, of the global system. And finally, uh, none of this could be done without solving our economic problems at home. And that had to be dealt with proactively and forthrightly in the midst of the crisis in 2009 uh, through very difficult political steps like TARP and recapitalizing the banks and things that were not popular politically, um, but also to promote growth and to commit to rebalancing our fiscal situation, consolidating our fiscal consolidation, our situation over the medium term. And let me just conclude with that, because I think what's remarkable about what you've heard so far is how much convergence there really is between Republicans and Democrats, uh, both on the nature of American power, the importance of projecting it going forward, and the importance of dealing with problems like the balance sheet that Senator Corker referred to. There is no disagreement between Republicans and Democrats on the importance of doing that. We may have differences on exactly the right balance between taxes and spending. Uh, but there's no disagreement that that's what we do, must do as a nation, and I share his optimism that we will get there. Wonderful. Now, we have about 10 minutes in a panel discussion before we come to you on the floor. And so far, I've noticed everybody's been very good and restrained. Maybe I will make the discussion a bit more difficult by posing a very difficult question. And, you know, we're talking about American power in the 21st century. Let's say fast forward 10 years from now, and this is quite a possibility budging by all estimates, Goldman Sachs and other estimates. In the year 2022, the World Bank announces that the country with the largest GNP is now China. In the same year, China announces that it's about to send a man or a woman to the moon. So it clearly has the most dynamic space exploration in the world. And is then perceived by the rest of the world to be the number one power and the United States would then be perceived to be the number two power. Now, how ready is the American population, you think, for such a kind of perception shift if it happens? I'm not saying it will happen, but if it happens, how ready are you? Well, thank goodness, it's a hypothetical. Um, <laughs> but it may be a we, bit more than a hypothetical. <laughs> well, there's no question about what. China is, um, is progressing and as their economy grows and ours um, goes through this slow process, uh, it makes it easier for them to gain on us. Uh, I think the facts are, though, that even China is seeing a very slowdown of, of their growth economically right now. But um, I think um, uh, a couple of things have got to happen. I, I say this in my stump speech that I've been all over the country um, uh, talking about with respect to the budget and our, our deficit and our debt. 
that um, we've got a window of opportunity as the United States to fix our fiscal house. It's going to happen. Our, our fiscal house is going to get fixed. Now, we either take the initiative to do it on our own terms or those individuals or those countries that buy our bonds, and right now the Chinese are the largest foreign purchaser of U.S. bonds, they're going to dictate to us what we're going to do to fix it. So now is the opportunity for us to do that. But if we don't, then that scenario, Dean, very well could play out. Um, I think um, uh, America's not prepared to be in second place, uh, and Americans are not prepared to be in second place. So I think you're going to see um, a stronger economy develop over a period of uh, the next couple of years. I share the optimism of, of Bob and, and Mark, and, and uh, we're going to get there. Uh, we, we may have our differences of opinion of what, uh, what policies we ought to enact to get there, but we're going to get there. That's what politics is all about. That's what elections are all about. And irrespective of who's the next president in the White House, the current one or another one, um, there's going to be a rallying around the effort to get our fiscal house in order and not allow that scenario to happen. Great answer. Congressman Louis. I agree with my colleague um, enthusiastically that we will get there. I think we may have differences as to approaches. I do believe that we have to deal with our long-term debt and our current deficit. But I also would agree with economists like Dr. Alan Blinder or Mark Zandi that at a time when the economy is weak, that we have to first invest here in our infrastructure, put people to work, and have a long-term plan to deal with the debt and the deficit. We have to put people to work here in the, not, not here, we're here in Zurich. I'm <laughs> sure we want to put people to work here as well. Yeah, the Swiss can work harder too, you know. <laughs> but I think it's essential to put people to work. Now, one of the challenges is, and in talking to my Chinese friends, they will admit that we have the creativity we produce Americans with extraordinary creativity. We can look at Apple, Google, et cetera. And they are extremely good at taking that creativity activity, and do a super job of manufacturing and taking the business from us. The president addressed some of these issues in his State of the Union, and I know it's going to be a continuing debate. But I'm very proud of our creativity among our students and our workers. And the question is, how do you create the jobs at home? So I would, I would agree with my colleague that the debt, the deficit, are serious issues. Mm. And we have to plan to do it with a seriousness of purpose. But right now, I am very concerned about jobs, investment in education, make sure we're training our workers for the jobs of the future, and I will put my faith in the creativity of the American people and look forward to positive <laughs> dealing with the debt, but right now, mm. invest in our people. So you're still seeing America remaining number one then? Without a doubt. Okay. Senator Cocker, I'm trying to see whether there'll be anybody who will say that. <laughs> so, an American value, is it not that we want people throughout the world to, to do well and to live with a high standard of living? So if you look at a country like China with the number of people that it has, I think every American would want people in China not to live in poverty but to have better lives. And, you know, history has shown countries that aren't able to generate that for their, the people who live there end up having social unrest and sometimes turn their attention to create outward problems to consolidate uh, people's thinking within. So, look, I think uh, Americans would want, as they think it through, for people in China to do well. If people in China do well, if you look at the demographics, the size of the economy is going to be very large. Uh, and so, I think all of us can do the math. 
Uh, we all look at the growth rates. And, uh, and yet I'll stop there because I'm not going to take your, uh, I'm not going <laughs> to bite it, whatever it is you're trying to get me to bite at and tell you. But I, I'll, I'll agree with Saxby. The American people absolutely uh, are not, would not be prepared psychologically for an event uh, where the world began to believe that uh, it was not uh, the greatest power on earth. And should an economy end up being bigger than, than uh, the American economy, my sense is that maybe a focus then would be uh, on the type of innovation, creativity. Um, you look at a Goldman Sachs type operation just to use financial operations versus some sluggish other kind of large bank that really, I mean, you might look at America in a different way, but uh, I don't want to look at it that way today. I'm not going to say that's the way it's going to be, but I will tell you that the American psychology certainly is not prepared uh, to deal with that. Mm, no, thank you. Dr. Froman, you've been an academic, and you know academics are allowed to think the unthinkable and say the unsayable. I'm afraid I'm in violent agreement with my uh, <laughs> colleagues up here uh, in a number of respects. Uh, I, I succeeded in getting the two parties to agree. Yes, exactly. <laughs> now, this is something they cannot accomplish over there, but in Davos they can. <laughs> it's the mountain air, perhaps. But, uh, uh, but I certainly agree with, uh, with what Senator Corker said, which is we, we welcome uh, the rise of a prosperous, stable China where millions or hundreds of millions of additional people are lifted out of poverty. Um, at the same time, uh, I think the question is what kind of China will we face? And will it be a China that plays by and abides by the international rules and norms that have governed the international system for the last 60 years and have allowed for, com for countries like China to grow and prosper? Uh, or do they follow their own set of rules that puts at risk the prosperity of other, of other peoples and other countries? And uh, I think uh, I, won't, I won't rise to debate on the number one question either. I, I'm convinced we will be number one as entrepreneurs in our education, our, our higher education system, and our ability to be creative and come up with new ideas uh, and to lead the global economy uh, in, all of those, in all of those factors. But it's very important that we help encourage, not just us, but the international community, that as China grows and becomes a bigger player in the international system, that they abide by international rules and norms as well. Thank you very much. I think we've had a good discussion now. The floor is open. Uh, the dean of the Harvard Kennedy School very wisely said that the question should have, good questions should have three elements. One, the name of the questioner. Two, very short presentation. Three, end with a question mark. So please, over to you. You can take the microphone, identify yourself. And, yeah. I'm Su Qi from Taijing Magazine, based in Beijing, China. Hmm. So you say you are not prepared for the second place. We have to say we are not prepared for the first place. <laughs> <laughs> the total volume you're, of the you're GDP. You're so modest, you know, you Chinese. <laughs> <laughs> the total volume of the GDP <laughs> in 10 years or so may be very alarming, but the per capita GDP is low. And yeah. we are preoccupied with the division of the pie, with the social safety net, or the poverty reduction. And without the US policing, maybe it will all problematic for the energy security, for the security, this kind of thing. Mm. But we have to make some contributions to the global governance in case you say we are too selfish, making money at the mm. expense of your policing efforts. Mm. <laughs> okay. So you don't have a question, it's a comment then. Okay, gentlemen in the back there, please. Yes. Yes. Can I, can I, just can I get a sense, how many questions out there, roughly? One more here, two, three, four, okay, four. Great. Go ahead. Yeah. Your yeah, microphone's not working, I mean. Just try. <laughs> Hello, hello, is that good? Ron Freeman, Atlanta Council, Washington, D.C. There's one area in which America is sadly first and likely to remain so, and that is the cost of health care per, per capita. But it, America is definitely not first in terms of infant morbidity or mortality, life expectancy, or general health care. The health bill turned into a political Donnybrook, started out as cooperation between the Congress and the President. These are very leading members of the Congress. What are we going to do about American health care? Yeah. 
Does anybody uh, want to take a step? Okay, Senator I'll Chambers. I'll take a shot at it first. Uh, there's no question but what um, the rising cost of health care in the United States is, is a major contributor to our current economic situation. And there's also no question about the fact that um, we have frankly done nothing over the last several years to try to curtail that rising cost. And it's, it's a cost within the private sector as well as in the public sector that's rising every day. And it's a cost that we've got to get our arms around. That being said, it is very difficult from a policymaking standpoint to enact measures to, let's say, um, reform Medicare. We have outside groups who, as soon as we use that term, reform Medicare, they go ballistic and say, well, you're going to cut Medicare. We, we're not going to cut Medicare. We can't cut Medicare. We, we owe it to people in the United States to, uh, to have that valuable program. But if we don't make the right kind of, of changes in this very valuable system, then the system's going broke and it's not going to be there. Uh, so it's, it's health, situa health programs like that that have got to be addressed. Um, the other side of that is that Americans have gotten very spoiled because even though our health care costs are um, significantly higher percentage-wise than other industrialized countries, I would submit that the quality of health care that Americans get is unsurpassed in any other country in the world. There are some that uh, in some areas it may be equal, but overall um, Americans get very good quality health care. A lot of them don't have to pay for it. Um, that's probably going to have to change. There are individuals who uh, receive, whether it's Medicare or other health care benefits, that uh, are high income earners that may have to start putting a little more skin in the game. There are a number of ideas like this that are floating around in Congress right now, but there is a general agreement among Republicans and Democrats that we've got to make sure we protect this program for the long term. And that is a very, very difficult political thing to do, but it's got to be done. Now, I'll, I'll leave Obamacare to, uh, to Bob and <laughs> the rest of the folks here. Okay, so Congressman Lowy, a short answer, because I think we have lots of questions. I'll give a very yeah. short answer. Uh, with great respect for the senator, um, it took a while to pass the health care bill. A health care bill that 8 million federal employees have and all members of Congress have. And the pejorative is calling it Obamacare. I think we're really unfortunate. Most of us would not say it is perfect, but most of us would say let's amend it. Let's make some changes in the health care bill. But it's taken a long time for the House and Senate to pass anything that approach universal care. So I personally would be happy to work with my good friend Senator Chambliss in all the issues he was talking about. But let's not try to repeal a bill that took so many years that is the kind of plan that 8 million as I mentioned, healthcare workers and all of us have right now. Okay, thank uh, you. Let, let, me, let me just briefly. Uh, if you don't want to make this into a healthcare debate. <laughs> yeah. But, but, and I'm not going to debate, I just make some quick points. Number one, um, I, obviously we don't know what's going to happen because we have a Supreme Court ruling that's going to occur this summer, a presidential race that will have an effect on all of this. You know, I'm not going to, it's going to have an effect. But what we've done in America is we've focused on access, which is very, very important. We have not focused on the quality side of it, and that takes long, tough work. You know, you need somebody at CMS for 20 years, if you will, to see through uh, the kind of changes that need to take place. Uh, one of the big frailties is this was a bill that 535 Congress people created. I mean, what a disaster, okay? I mean, there's no way that, that you can create something that doesn't have three or four focus points, and that's what this bill became. So my sense is that this bill will definitely evolve. There's no question. I don't think there's a thinking person in Washington that believes as constructed it will continue. I, I don't think there's anybody on either side of the aisle, but a big part of it will be determined this summer. But we as a country have 
pl placed our sole focus on access and not done the tough work that's necessary to, to focus on the quality that the gentleman just mentioned. Okay, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to sh shift back to American power in the 21st century. Uh, gentleman over here, yes. And maybe I'll take three questions if you don't mind, just so that you get a sense of the questions on the floor. One from here, one from here, and one there. Okay. I'm yeah. Aaron Kramer from the U.S. And I'd like to take on this point about American exceptionalism. Um, isn't it the case that um, as a rhetorical device, American exceptionalism is extremely counterproductive because A, it's not supported by the facts. America is not at the top when it comes to broadband, health care, maternal health, you, you name it. Um, and doesn't it also really undermine debate and experimentation that we need by suggesting that the only good answers come from within the borders of the United States? I, I find that it's shutting off the American mind and, and therefore I feel that it's, it's cutting off opportunities to uh, improve our political debate. Okay, gentleman over here in front there. No, no, this, this, just, sorry. Yep. sorry. Hi, I'm Rod Beckstrom, uh, CEO of ICANN, Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, uh, a, a global inter internet coordination body. When we look, we have a hard time for seeing technology in a year or two or three, and it's obviously important for the world and the relationship of the world and uh, geopolitically. So I, my question for the panelists is how do you see internet and the integration of humans through the internet changing where we are in 100 years, and, and won't that have a huge effect on this equation? Okay. Go ahead, then I'll come to you. Yeah. Hi, I'm David Beckman from Bread for the World in the U.S. Um, I'm actually really upbeat about the U.S. political process since the crisis, both Bush and Obama and both parties. I think you've done a pretty good job in the end, and I especially appreciate the fact that you haven't really whacked programs that help poor people uh, including the international programs. And the four of you have all played important roles in, uh, in the governance of the last couple of years. The brinksmanship last year really did us a lot of damage. So I was interested in your comment, Senator Corker, about a growing centrist coalition. Um, I, I'm interested in where you see that happening. Yeah. Good. So, um, I, I, let me just uh, come to the last question over there. And I'm glad you posed the question to a specific senator or a member of the panel. That makes it much easier for the responses, please. Hi, um, Ahmed Paralil from Turkey. Uh, you all seem to have a consensus on the fact that American, American military power should remain uh, the, the world's strongest military. Uh, I'm wondering what is the criteria the American government should use to use that military power anywhere around the world? Okay. So maybe, uh, can we start off with Senator Cocker, where you're responding to the specific question about the brinksmanship? So uh, first of all, I want th uh, the Simpson-Bowles Commission, I think, provided a beginning framework uh, for a lot of very good discussions. And around the issue of tax reform, I, I think we will see in our country, regardless of the rhetoric uh, that's occurring right now, I think you're going to see a flattening, uh, uh, an elimination of lots of what people would call loopholes, we call them tax expenditures, a lowering of marginal rates, uh, but an increase in the amount of revenue that's generated. And I think there's a tremendous amount of consensus that's building around that, both on the individual and corporate side. I really believe that. I believe there's, in concept, 60, 70 votes in the Senate for that type of thing. Now, you know, the details, obviously, they're tough. On the, on the, on the Medicare piece, I, I'm seeing proposals now where we say, okay, let's leave, let's leave fee-for-service in place for people who worry about things like uh, uh, premium support, but let's have an alternative track that basically looks a lot like Medicare Advantage. I see some breakthroughs taking place there. So I really do, um, on the big picture, I th I, if I didn't believe this, I would not run again for the United States Senate. But I believe over the next two, th two or three years, you're going to see real tax reform that generates economic growth. You're going to see entitlement reform that saves these programs, saves these programs, which I think is something you care deeply about. The average American family today pays over their lifetime into Medicare $119,000. And the average American family 
when they begin receiving Medicare, takes out 357,000. And that formula is not one that's sustainable. So we've got to figure out a different way of making it work, especially for people without means. But I see, I see it, and I think, we, I think we're very, very close. And I think regardless of who is president, you're going to see major tax reform, major entitlement reform, and as a result, long-term deficit reduction. I just believe it. Dr. Froman, can you respond to the question on American exceptionalism? Then I'll yeah. come to sure, I'd be happy to. Uh, look, I think I think we, I think I fundamentally disagree uh, with the with the premise of the question because I don't think American exceptionalism means uh, we have all the answers. We're always right. There's no debate, and we don't respect the views of others. Um, I think, in fact, what one of the parts of American exceptionalism is how self-critical we are and how open to debate we are internally about whether we're heading in the right direction or not and whether our values are lined up with our interests or not. I'm struck uh, that you know, we went through, frankly, a difficult period earlier this decade where there were a lot of people around the world who didn't like what the U.S. was doing in Iraq and didn't like the, US, the position of the U.S. generally in, in, on world affairs. But I am struck that whether it's the G8 or the G20 or in travels around Asia or engagement in Africa or engagement in the Middle East, People want us there, and they want our engagement, and they, they value our values. And that's what American exceptionalism is. To me, to go back to, to our, chair, our, our moderator's opening point, uh, and it goes a little bit to the, the, uh, the, the last question's point, uh, we are seen largely as benign, as keepers of the system. And we are constantly taking actions that we view, as, not that they're not in our interest, but are also in the interest of building a stronger, a fairer, a more just international system. And not every country does that in the world. And the US does, whether it's Republican or Democratic administration. And I think that's what has held us well in terms of a providing influence over the long run. Okay, Congressman Lowy, you want to respond to the internet question? Yes, I want to um, be very brief, because I know time, I agree with so much what Michael said. First of all, I want to say bread for the world uh, reflects probably the very best of our non-governmental organizations. And I want to thank you. <coughs> and I am proud that the US government does support these organizations. This is a critical part of our outreach to the world to help lift people up. Secondly, I did want to respond to the Atlantic Council because many of us appreciate you and others who are always there to give us advice and support when we have to make difficult decisions. Now, to respond to the gentleman from Turkey, one of the things that I am most proud of in this administration is the leadership of President Obama and the Secretary and the Vice President in operating not solely as a unilateral country. We should be strong. I'm proud that we're strong. But reaching out to the UN, building coalitions, and addressing the many challenges, I would hope as I look forward, in a peaceful way. I just wanted to make the point that although we have said America must be a power, the power, I would hope we can use our power to move the community in peaceful ways to achieve goals through consensus. Okay, I think Senator Chambers is chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee. Why do you need the world's largest military? <laughs> Well, I think it's important that as the leader of the free world that uh, we're able to respond militarily when we're called on. I mean, look, it's, it's not just the leader of the free world from a military standpoint that the United States is in the position of, because uh, if there is an international crisis, whether it's a health care crisis, where the CDC is at the forefront, whether it's a, a natural disaster where our um, National Guard may be called and sent to, to some other country, um, or whether it's the economic crisis that we're going through now, or whether it's a military conflict or a military issue, the United States is always the first country that's looked to, and the reason is is because we always respond. So we've got to be in a position to respond from a military standpoint. Uh, the the uh, the one thing we know about military conflicts is that very smart American military personnel have projected over the years where the next conflict will be and who our next adversary is going to be. 
And we've been wrong 100% of the time. <laughs> so what we have to do and why it's important that, that we remain a powerful military is that we know we're going to be called on to respond somewhere. But uh, who would have imagined 10 years ago that we'd be firing 50-pound Hellfire missiles uh, as a part of a military conflict and we could do it in such a precise way as what we're doing today? Uh, who could imagine that um, um, we would be in, in Afghanistan? Most Americans had not even heard of Afghanistan 15, 20 years ago. Um, so it's important that we remain diverse, and it's important that we remain powerful militarily. But Bob Corker made a very good point that, um, you know, we got a lot of friends, <clears throat> friends around the world, whether it's members of NATO or otherwise, who have provided military assistance in, in both Iraq and Afghanistan. And I think you're going to see more and more of that in the future because we can't afford to expend U.S. taxpayer money <clears throat> being a policeman of the world. It's going to be in concert with other countries. And um, I think that's good. Uh, I, I think that that uh, even though we provide the right kind of leadership, the right kind of technology, the right kind of uh, weapon systems, and the right kind of manpower, it will always, in my opinion, in the future, be in concert with other nations. And Turkey's been a great ally, by the way. <laughs> Next round of questions. And if you are short and sharp, we can take two, three questions before we final round. I saw a gentleman at the back that he left. No more questions? I don't believe this. One over here. Okay, please, over there. Okay, over here then. <coughs> over there and over here. Then I have to think of some difficult questions, you know. <laughs> My name is Kel Louis Pettis, and I'm from Denmark. For 10 years, the countries of the world, or at least 153 of them, have been negotiating the Doha round. So looking at the 21st century from an American point of view, is the Doha round dead? And if so, what will be the US trade policy going forward? Mm. Good question. Yeah. Over here. Uh, my name is Rob Chabrashuli. I'm from Georgia. My question is uh, the perception also when we are speaking about uh, US involvement in Europe is that uh, perception is that it's a little bit declining and uh, Senator Corker somehow mentioned a little bit dissatisfaction how the, some of the NATO allies uh, contribute to the security. So can you a little bit uh, uh, comment more on the, how U.S. sees uh, the, this transatlantic partnership with, with Europe? Okay. Any more questions? If not, can I add a third question? You know, I'm sure you've all heard of uh, this book by Farid Zakaria where he speaks about the post-American world, you know, emerging. Now, what's your reaction to this thesis that we may be entering a, a post-American world as we talk about the future of American power? So again, who would like to start first? Uh, Doha around, maybe. Michael, you start. I'll do trade policy. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> unless anybody else would like to. <laughs> um, uh, Just tell us when you'll be completed, that's all. Right. So. Uh, I think that you're absolutely right. There's been 10 years uh, of negotiations in Doha, and they have not reached a successful, successful conclusion, um, not for lack of effort, not even for lack of political will, but because I think the world has fundamentally changed over a decade. And the China, India, Brazil, and emerging economies that existed in 2000, 2001 are quite different today. So it's no longer appropriate, and this really goes to the point I said about China living up to international norms and obligations, it's no longer appropriate for us to provide unfettered access or new access to our market without other economies opening their markets as well. We were not able to achieve that, and we are still committed, we the U.S. and I think all the parties in Geneva, to seeing what parts of the Doha Round agenda, which we're still committed to, we can try and get done in, in various ways. Um, you know, at the same time, you know, we've completed the three FTAs uh, and, and with the help of bipartisan support in Congress, um, uh, have, have those ratified and those will be implemented. We've launched the Trans-Pacific Partnership, yeah. which is very important because it, it, its goal is to set 
a new high standard for international trade agreements among first the countries that started this negotiation, but eventually other countries as well who want to join and are committed to those international rules and norms. And we're hopeful that those, those standards will eventually make their way into the multilateral uh, trading system as well. We're in deep dialogue with the, uh, the European Union. Uh, we've announced a high-level panel to look at a whole range of ways of expanding trade, and it could be everything from a little bit more regulatory cooperation to an FTA or something beyond an FTA. And we're in that, in that process of analysis now. And we're focused in Geneva on seeing what can get done, both multilaterally, which is very important, but also uh, potentially plurilaterally. Yeah. Just so very quickly this. on Doha also, because I've been very much involved in that because of my former position as chairman of the Ag Committee. Obviously, there are three segments to the Doha round. You've got the manufacturing sector, you've got the services sector, and the agricultural sector. It was thought, the perception was there, that Ag was the one that was holding this up. But at the end of the day, it was the services sector that really caused the last negotiations to fall apart. Um, I'm sure that those negotiations under uh, USTR uh, Ambassador Ron Kirk, who's a terrific uh, guy and very positively trade-oriented, are going to resume. Uh, we're going to have a farm bill this year. We have talked within the ag community that we've got to make sure it's WTO compliant. That answers the questions that the Doha round presented. Um, so hopefully um, uh, we'll have a a, um, at the end, if not this year, certainly within the next couple of years, we'll, we'll have an end to the Doha round. It'll be concluded positively. And do you want to respond quickly to the question he asked about NATO? Sure. And sure. Um, I think I was the first elected official in the country of Georgia in Sarkisvili's office after Russia. You all had a little skirmish recently, and, and uh, um, uh, my comments were meant and are about the fact that the relationship has got to be more robust than it is. Um, there is no question with the pressures that many of the European countries have had fiscally and, and maybe for other reasons, NATO has become something different than I think originally envisioned. And my point is, is that that rebalancing, and I think Senator Chambliss alluded to that too, has got to change. For, the, for there to really be a real robust relationship. Um, uh, it's been a little bit, not every country, but generally speaking, it's been too one-sided oriented towards the United States of America. For what it's worth, um, I thought the way the president handled Libya, I, 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 first of all, I never thought Libya was in our national interest. I may uh, get some ire from the people here in the room, I, I didn't see that as necessarily being in our national interest. But if we were going to be there, I thought the way it was handled by the administration was far better than us taking the lead. Congressman Lowy, you want to touch the question about the post-American world? Or? I'd be delighted to respond to that. Um, I wish all the countries of the world strength, economic progress, progress in democracy, progress in human rights, giving each of their people the opportunity to live a good, complete life. And I would hope, I have not read the Fareed Zakaria book, I apologize, I would hope they can join us in being part of the international community, working through difficulties at the UN. And I am not ready to say, no, they cannot <laughs> reach the level that we have achieved, but I wish all well and hope we can work together. Uh, Dr. Froman, you want to add something to any other questions? Uh, I, I'm, I won't, Fareed's a friend, so I won't review his book, but um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I would simply say, um, uh, to go back to really the purpose of his book, uh, I think we're in an American century, I think we will be in an American century. It, it requires us to exercise our influence uh, more intelligently, uh, more creatively, and some of the things that, that Dave was talking about in terms of whether it's food security or global health or other pandemics, we need to be able to show the leadership in, in dealing with those issues as well as the traditional issues of American foreign policy. Mm -hmm. But I have no doubt that we have uh, uh, very good days ahead of us. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we've had an interesting one hour. You, you, you must say that uh, before this panel discussion began, 
I was afraid that the polarization across in America would spill over here. I'm amazed by the amount of agreement here. There's agreement that America will always be number one. <laughs> There's agreement that they'll, they'll take care of the fiscal deficit. There's agreement that they'll work with the rest of the world. So it's amazing. We've, we've achieved a lot of agreement here in, in Davos. So now all you have to do is now transport the spirit of Davos back to Washington, D.C. And once that's done, the world will be a better place. So thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.